Hello and welcome. As you may know, today at Campus Party is dedicated to women in technology. And I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Purnima Vijaya Shankar, who came from the US. And she will talk to us about the future of financial tech. Purnima is the founding engineer of Mint.com, which is one of the main startups that sparked revolution in banking. Please welcome Purnima on stage. All right, well, thank you. It's, it's great to be here in London. It's my second trip here and first time staying for a full week. So I've gotten a chance to really see a lot and now it's time to get back to business. So today we're gonna talk about the future of, oh, future of financial tech. And uh, Senya already gave a brief introduction, but just to kind of highlight who I am and what I've done. Um, you know, on here it seems pretty engineering heavy, so you're probably wondering what the hell do I know about finance, right? But I actually started as an economics major and then decided that I really wanted to build. Um, and fortunately, the first startup I started was uh, Mint.com. How many of you are familiar with Mint? Okay, handful of you. For those of you who don't know what Mint is, uh, Mint is a personal finance website where we aggregate all of your accounts, your checking, your savings, your student loans, and then you get a complete picture of your finances. And you can do things like automatically set budgets. And the reason we came up with this is that, you know, as you know, in the US, there are so many banks and institutions out there. And on top of that, people really struggle with keeping track of their money. So we made this to be as push button as possible and in 2009 ended up selling it. And then after it sold, I started my next startup, BusyBee. And the purpose of BusyBee is to help small business owners who really struggle with using technology to help them you know, make it more streamlined and simple. And through using BusyBee, they can keep track of their customers, they can get paid more easily, and they just have a good idea of how their small business is working. And we mainly target fitness studios and yoga studios because we have to start somewhere, right? Now, in the midst of building Mint as well as BusyBee, I started a blog called Femgineer, and this was back in 2006. Um, but over the last six, seven years, it's actually morphed into a education services startup. And so what I do uh, actually is provide online and offline courses and workshops on product development, on leadership. It's not all geared towards women, uh, but we certainly do have a mission of trying to get more than 50% representation of women into engineering and technical positions. And we, most recently, I got invited to teach at Duke, uh, where I talk about entrepreneurship specifically at the engineering school. So just a little background about me. Now, I know being here in London, there is a very, very rich history of banking and finance. So I'm not here to bore you with what finance is, or tell you things. Um, maybe you were hoping that I would explain how to make more money. I'm sorry, that's not this talk. But um, what I will be here to talk more about is the technology that you have probably already experienced and also explain how it's going to actually change in the coming years and also give you some idea of areas that haven't been explored yet. So for all you technologists who might want to build better products or get, or get more interested in finance, I'll give you some areas in which people aren't doing a whole lot of work. So when we start off asking this question of, you know, what is financial tech, right? People aren't really sure. And part of that is because it's actually quite a number of things. It incorporates investments. It incorporates payments, right? People just exchanging money for goods and services. Uh, it also has a lot to do with funding, whether or not you're starting a business or you're looking for funding for a larger business or even a small project. And then, of course, the most basic is there are financial services that offer reporting, kind of like Mint.com did. But the big thing I want to talk to you today about is, first of, of all, online, right? There's a lot of growth going on just in the online space. And then aside from that, when we talk about offline, there's also technology there. There's a number of devices that people are using today to do currency exchange or to do payment exchange. And then there's still some you know, room for financial reporting. And the final, of course, is you know, what does the future hold for us? So you know, back in the day, life used to be pretty simple when we thought about finance, right? We just used this stuff. 
Uh, not a lot of us had this stuff, and it was pretty much tied up just in the hands of the few, right? Probably the Queen of, of England or the King of England. And then things got a little bit more sophisticated. We moved away from the gold standard and we started to use currency as a way of exchanging, especially when we had various nations and each of them produced a different amount of goods and services. So for trade, you know, currency became a much easier format. And then we, of course, had commerce, right? Because we got to do something with all that money. And commerce was also pretty simple, right? People would mostly sell goods. There weren't a whole lot of services, but people would mostly sell goods. And they would always have these exchanges in person, right? So that's why we had these really large shipping yards. People would take crates. That's why there was a lot of that slave trade going on. But everything was pretty much done face to face. And there were mostly merchants that did all of the commerce. We also had these guys, right? These fancy financiers. And whenever we wanted to go and get some money, we'd have to go talk to these guys, right? Whether it was about starting a business, whether we wanted a home loan, or anything that we wanted, right? If we didn't produce the money ourselves, we'd have to go and talk to someone like this. And of course, when it came to storage, we used some simple techniques, right? Some of us used our mattress, some of us might still use our mattress given that there's banking crisis. And then, you know, a few others used just vaults. But then we started to put money into banks. We wanted interest. We felt like it was a little bit more safe. But this was all very boring, right? It's very stable. Everything kind of stayed within particular countries, or there are very few people that were exchanging goods amongst the various countries, or they were limited to just merchants. So then things got a little bit more interesting. And people decided that they wanted to move, right? They didn't just want to stay in one spot, partly because, you know, they wanted to conquer other countries, such as the British Empire. And as they started to move, they actually took their money with them. And then money also began to evolve. So it wasn't enough to have this paper currency. There started to be more and more representations of currency today. So we have simple things like, you know, PayPal that exchange money. And then, of course, we have good old plastic in two forms, either gift cards or in credit cards. And then we've got some new forms of currency coming out, like Bitcoin. There's still a lot of controversy around whether or not this is a good thing, and I'm not going to dig too much into it. But there are new forms of money that are being represented today purely in technology. But then things got even more interesting, right? And the markets actually started to change. We kept hearing about all these crunches that were happening. We had, in the US, a housing crunch. We then had a bank crisis. And then things became really widespread, where a lot of international markets and a lot of international banks started to really default. And that's when things got crazy. But there's one thing I want to make clear. All of these forms of technology actually never led to the assets falling, never led to the banking crisis, right? Too often it's easy to blame a tool or a technology, but most of the crisis that has come on, you know, since the early days up until now have always been man-made. They aren't technology-based. And the reason is because financial technology actually is meant to free people. It actually does a lot more good. Actually does, you know, mostly good. And one of the ways it frees us is from people like this guy, right, coming back to bankers. We're no longer at the mercy of going and asking him for money to take out a loan or to go and start a business. And the reason is because financial technology does basically three things. At the very high level, it starts with finance, right? Borrowing and lending. And so what has drastically changed in the last few years is that borrowing and lending are no longer limited to banks. In fact, banks won't even give you money if you show up at the door. Instead, there's more peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. And the reason technology helps with that is because it's now being recorded, right? We don't have to worry about giving somebody $10,000 or $100,000 or however much and then thinking that they'll default. There are now programs in place that make it a lot easier and we can also specify the amount of money we want to give as well as our risk level and interest rate level. 
So this kind of turned banking on its head and we don't necessarily need to have banks alone in order to get financed for the projects that we want to do. The other is, of course, collecting money has become a lot more simple. Once again, you'd have to set up a bank account a long time ago in order to actually get money, or you have to go up and set up a merchant account, get some authorization, get a bank to underwrite you. And this would all take more than a week to put in place. Not to mention, then you'd have to wait another week or possibly even a month to then receive a payout. And, and this was in the case if you were a merchant. So now, through e-commerce and devices, we're actually able to exchange money a lot faster. Merchants are able to get payments a lot faster. And even consumers, in the case of disputing a charge, are able to do that within 24 hours. And then the final is that we can actually track all of this movement, right? That's also pretty big. Before, we didn't know where all the money was going, who had it, or if we were a business, you know, everything would just be with a chartered accountant. But now business owners can see their money, and consumers can also see their money. So the goal of all of this technology is to make lives easier, both for businesses as well as for individuals. And the other benefit has actually been that it's contributed to the growth right, of a lot of markets. The primary, of course, being online. right? There's a lot going on there. And a number of emerging markets have benefited as well, because now they can sell their services outside of just the confines of their country or their location. Now, the biggest thing that's come out are sort of these four services, and there's more than this, right? How many of you are familiar with Kiva? Okay, not a, not a whole lot. So I actually don't know if Kiva is in the UK or in Europe, but one of the great things that Kiva did when it came out, uh, probably now over, I want to say, six or seven years ago, it might even be 10, um, is that it actually opened up this concept of micro-lending. So who in here is familiar with micro-lending? Okay, a couple of people in the back. Now, the great thing about micro-lending is, once again, you can offer just a little bit of money, right? Even if you don't have $10,000 or $100,000 to spare, you can give some woman who wants to start a business in Africa $50 or $25. You can also track the progress that she's making. And so this has made it a really great way for people to fund businesses, to access capital, and to feel like they're making a contribution to their country, to their ecosystem. So it's benefited both the lender as well as the borrower. And there are tight restrictions in place so that people don't feel like they're getting defrauded um, when they pay their money. And the folks that take the money also feel like they're making a contribution and they can explain what it is that they're using the money for. And then, of course, you know, there are things like Kickstarter, which have really started to take off. So I'm sure you've all heard of these crowdfunding platforms. And I know that they're becoming more and more popular, especially here in Europe, where access to things like angel investment is much less than in the US. So the great thing about something like Kickstarter, once again, is you can do pre-sales, you can get your products out there and test them, but the bigger thing is now you've got more people who are able to pool in money. You don't just have to go and ask your friends or your family for it. And then, of course, PayPal and Square have also become great in terms of collecting money, right? It's become a lot easier. You don't necessarily have to go through that rigmarole of setting up a bank account and waiting to get paid over the course of a week or a month. So if you're a small business owner and need to have that liquidity, it makes it a lot easier. So the big thing is that things like Kickstarter and Kiva have democratized access to capital, right? The woman in a sub-African country can go and get a microloan, can start her business. She doesn't have to wait or to go into a big city or ask a financier for capital, right? She can explain what her business is and she can make the micropayments in return to the microfunds that were lent to her. And then, similarly, a product like Kickstarter has made crowdfunding a great resource for people who have product ideas, who want to put their products out in the market, but might not be able to do a production run, or might not know if the product has viability, right? So a lot of it is giving small business owners, whether they're you know, 
in a, in a large continent like Africa or whether they're in a place like Europe uh, or America where they're trying to build products, it's given them the ability to start their businesses and bring their ideas to the marketplace. So it's become a lot cheaper as a result to start a business. And of course, there's some caveats to this. Right, the first is that the business owners still have to make a profitable business. Remember, I said financial tech isn't going to make money for you. You still have to make the money, but it's going to make it easier for you to have access to that capital. And then, of course, even funding platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo sometimes put restrictions depending on the type of product that you're selling. And a lot of that, once again, is because banking in general is in that regulatory market. And so they want to make sure that things don't get too out of control, and they want to make sure that the products being sold are actually then you know, going to go to the end consumer and that the person that's selling them is also reputable. So the other thing that's been great, not only in helping the small business owners, but just with peer-to-peer -peer exchange, right? Companies like MoneyGram coming out have made it a lot easier for us to send money across the country or across the world, right? Before, who would have even thought of sending money? Most people would have just stuffed an envelope and then hoped that it would have gotten to their parents or their children or their family members in another country, right? So MoneyGram has made it a lot more simple and companies like PayPal have also made it easy for you to send payments just through email. But of course, once again, there are some restrictions, right? The amount of money that you can send really depends on how long you've been using a service like PayPal. And then, of course, it also depends on where you're sending it to, right? We're still, unfortunately, um, at the mercy of all of the various rules and regulations across countries. So there's still quite a bit of banking bureaucracy that's taking place across international markets. That technology is trying to penetrate, but it's going to take some time and it's going to require some policy changes. And then, of course, the final is that we're adding transparency to the system. So example, with Mint.com, people started to become more and more aware that they were getting charged these exorbitant banking fees, right? An overdraft fee, a we're holding your money safely fee, you know, just you name it. And people weren't really sure what was going on. But now that there is this level of transparency, people can now hold the banks accountable too. So this is another form of democratizing finance. Now, there are some more use cases, of course. And there's things like trading platforms. So people, a lot of times, um, especially hedge funds, use this to automate trades. There are people that use it for forecasting. But you know, forecasting really depends. It's not 100% there yet. And it's going to take more and more time. And part of that, of course, is that we can't predict how volatile a market is going to be. So forecasting is only so good as the amount of data you have and as good as a market is stable. And then, of course, people want to do risk assessment, especially for insurance markets and even when it comes to financing other organizations. And then the last is we need more reporting, right? Once again, it's not enough to have all of the accounting data and all of the financial data in the hands of a chartered accountant or on Excel or in a notebook somewhere, right? We need to be able to access, access this. We need to see where our money's going. Now, in the old days of commerce, as I said, people would meet in person and they would have to be tied to a particular location, right? So that meant either getting on a boat or walking over to a place. But because of technology, you know, it was very limiting. We just didn't have a lot of forms of technology. So for the seller, they were really limited in, in their location. And for the buyer, they were also limited to the, uh, the amount of goods and services that were available, right? So this really limited the marketplace. And not only that, but it also limited the amount of innovation that was going on and people's awareness. But now, thanks to, once again, technology and the internet, we have e-commerce, right? And it's really expanded, especially in countries uh, or in places like Europe, and the great thing is that it's actually opened up a few different new markets. So the first is this peer-to-peer -peer market, which you're all familiar with, right? 
So things like eBay that have now become very, very prevalent didn't exist 20 years ago. But through this, people are able to exchange whatever crap that they want to exchange with one another. The other thing is that it's opened up the amount of inventory that's available, right? So now the goods and services that we were limited to based on location have also increased. So Amazon has definitely been one of those companies that's helped push that movement. And then the final is that we can access people across different geographies. So if I want to be able to rent an apartment from somebody in London, I can do that on Airbnb today. I certainly wouldn't have been able to do that many, many years ago. And not only that, but I can do so with the confidence of a consumer, right? Before there was a lot of mistrust and you know, didn't really know if you would get a place once you showed up. But these kinds of companies have definitely made it so that the technology is benefiting the consumer as well as the seller. So it's made it a lot easier to sell, but it's also made it much more safer for the consumer. And the reason is because it's very, very simple to set up these forms of technology, right? You can get an account on any of these platforms within minutes. And then when it comes to getting paid out, you know, within one or two days, your banks get verified. And then the third is you can post whatever goods and services you're offering, right? So just this ease of being able to set up a store rather than we ha what we had to do before, which was set up a physical store, have made it much easier for people to sell online. So then we ask the question, well, what's the future of e-commerce, right? It feels like we already know what it is. We know it's a big market. We know we can sell a lot of things on here. Well, you know, how big is it, right? Well, we noticed that between 2013 and 2012, we've actually increased by 14.8% purely in the US alone. So this is retail. But there's still some level of unease. You know, back in the day when we were exchanging goods in person, people felt a lot more confident, right? They would get paid immediately and then they would give the goods. But, you know, they still worried about things like notes being counterfeit or people forging checks. So it wasn't always the case that it was 100%. But now people are more and more worried. They're worried that as they continue these exchanges online, they aren't sure who the identity is of the seller. They want to know what their reputation is. They also, at some level, want to know even who the buyer is. Right? They want to make sure that whoever's going to show up to their Airbnb apartment is going to be someone who's going to take care of the place. So there's a lot of financial technology that's wrapped up in identity management. Now, a lot of people are really worried about this and they think it's somehow rampant. But if we look at the statistics, it's less than 1%. And part of that is because people are really focused and conscious about fraud detection. So just in the US alone, you know, it's about 0.9% of all online revenue. That's still a lot, you know, 3.5 billion. I'm sure we could bail out some countries, maybe some small European countries with that amount of funding, right? But the point I bring up is that it's not as large as we would think. And then the other is that on an international side, you know, while it is a bit higher because they don't have all the systems in place, when people are exchanging goods and services online, internationally, they're more likely to reject an order. So that means that the funds don't even get transferred, and hence there isn't this loss. Now, the big thing though when it comes to developing technology, and for those of you who might care about identity management, is there's already a few things that are taking place. So the first is there is this fraud score model that people are trying to create so that they can keep track of how fraudulent somebody might be. But that, of course, really depends on people's online behavior. Unfortunately, people who are fraudsters don't have a very good digital footprint. And so if you don't have a very good digital footprint, then your fraud score is going to be much higher right, than someone who does. The second is people monitor the website behavior itself. So if you're coming to the site and it looks like you might be trying to penetrate it or try to hack into it, then they are going to flag you and they're not going to sell to you. And then the third is they look at your order history, right? Have you made a lot of exchanges? Have you ordered a lot of goods but haven't completed a purchase? Or you know, what have you actually been ordering? 
And then the, the, the third and the, the fourth and fifth are, they want to know what this velocity is. So how many of you are familiar with velocity monitoring? OK, so just only one person. So basically, this idea of uh, velocity monitoring is that a lot of times people will check to see if I came from America and I took a flight all the way to London, you know, within the amount of time that it takes me to London, are there transactions on my credit card? And if there are, then it's very likely that I didn't make them. Right? So this is this concept of velocity. Now, if I've been here for a week and I've done a lot of purchases, then clearly the charges aren't fraudulent. Right? So that's this concept of order velocity. And then the final, like I said before, is this identity trail. Can we keep a digital footprint of people? And this kind of gets into the issue of, are we being more of a big brother or big sister? And you know, do we actually want to do that? But if you know, we want to cut down those fraud numbers, then this is going to be a uh, necessity. So there's also more and more sophisticated forms of fraud detection. Uh, there's all, obviously card verification, but of course, if you have stolen credit cards, then it doesn't really matter if you verify the numbers, right? Um, there's also a lot of two-factor authentication where you'll have to sh show two forms in order to actually prove that you are the person who's going to do the transaction. And then you might use an address verification service. But once again, if you're moving around a lot, it doesn't always help. And of course, you can contact the card issuer, but if they've stolen your mobile phone, then once again, you know, not the best use. So these are more sophisticated, but they clearly have limitations. And so basically what this comes down to is that we've got some competing interests here, right? We want to make it so that these systems are very, very scalable and that we are able to do millions and billions of transactions every day, every week, and every month on an online e-commerce site. And we also want to make sure that the merchant is able to get access to, the, to their cash, right? So providing them liquidity, uh, uh, liquidity and providing the consumer an easy way to get their goods quickly, right? We want that one-click purchase. But it competes against this idea of security, right? What do we need to do to secure these systems? We might have to do more identity verification. We might have to, do, have to come up with more sophisticated algorithms. This will eventually slow down you know, how easy it is to purchase. So there is some level of debate there. Um, you know, ultimately, it's probably going to be up to the small business owner to decide, right? But in the case of these large uh, fraudulent fees, the small business owner will be held accountable. So it's probably in his or her best interest. Now, aside from just purely online, right, the folks that are still operating an offline business are going to have the benefit of using a number of devices. I'm sure many of you have seen all of these devices, the Google Wallet, the PayPal here, or the PayPal Triangle, and then, of course, Square. Now, the great thing about all these devices is that it makes it very, very easy, once again, for these businesses to get approved and to actually issue the transaction. And they also have very, very low transaction fees. And the other is that they oftentimes do funds transfers very quickly within a couple business days. So the small business owners don't have to wait. But some of the drawbacks of these technologies are that they're becoming too commoditized, right? They're all very, very much the same. But unfortunately, they're all built on different platforms. So now the consumer has to adopt each, an account for each one of these things. It's essentially becoming a lot like credit cards again, right? where you've got a Visa, an Amex, a MasterCard. Consumers don't necessarily like that. So there needs to be some form of aggregation that has to take place in this space in order for us to see more going on with mobile payments. Otherwise, you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to come up with a mobile payments device and it's going to drive the consumer insane. Now, there are, of course, small businesses that don't even have to use devices, right? There's a number of device agnostic services, like a FreshBooks purely for billing if you're doing invoicing. Same thing with bill.com, right? These are great because for the knowledge-based worker who isn't exchanging goods but services, they have an easy way to once again transact. So we've talked a lot about businesses, right, and all of the ways in which they can use to issue these transactions. They can use online services if they have an e-commerce store, or they can use devices, or they can use online billing services. But what about the consumer, right? What's, what can they do? Well, they can also use a number of these just as well. 
There are a number of services that have come out that have made peer-to-peer -peer exchange and lending a lot more easy. So of course the classic are Square, PayPal, and WePay. How many of you have heard of WePay? It's a little bit, most of these are, are unfortunately limited to the US, but you can take a lot of these and still apply the concept to uh, you know, Europe and the European markets. Now the reason a lot of these are limited to the United States has to do with, once again, fraud and underwriting the transactions. So they still rely on banks to give them that risk assessment. And until they prove that they have enough volume of transactions, they can't move into European or other global markets. So that, of course, gives you a lot of freedom to, in the meantime, innovate and create these technologies locally. And then finally, you know, for the consumer, they're going to want to know where all their money is going. So they're going to want to do some financial planning. So there's the example I give of Mint.com, my company, and here's LearnVest, another company that's geared a little bit more to the women's market. Once again, both of these are US-based, and part of that reason is people just aren't sure if in Europe and other markets people care as much about their finances and they actually want to go through the stages of planning. You know, previously there were some cultural differences where in the US, you know, they're very, very nuclear family units um, and, and much more individualistic than in Europe and Asia where people had much more, you know, larger family units. And so the concept of financial planning just hasn't quite taken off um, or the need for it. But if you see a need, you know, certainly go down that path. And then same thing with a company like Wealthfront, which is purely focused on managing investments for consumers. Once again, in the US, there are a lot of private individuals that have investment accounts. And if this is applicable to the European market, then it's certainly a product that needs to exist. So I mentioned that there's a number of unsolved problems, right, that exist today, and this gives you the opportunity as technologists and as innovators to come into this space and build products. So the first is that there's still a number of people, especially in the US, who are unbanked. And by unbanked, what I mean by that is they either have a very, very low credit score where they cannot actually apply for a credit card, or the most common case is they just don't have a lot of money, so they can't even apply for a bank account. And in both of those cases, you know, some of it has to do with the fact that they're between jobs or a lot of times they're students and they you know, clearly have been in school for a while so they don't have the funds. So a lot of these cases, they don't have access to capital and it makes it hard for them. And there's not a whole lot of technology solutions around this. And the technology solutions that need to exist are to you know, put checks and balances in place so that they can get access. The second, which we've talked about before, is identity theft, right? We still have a lot that has to go on in this space um, when it comes to people stealing one another's credit card identities or financial identities. In the US, um, it's more common is social security fraud, where people are stealing social security numbers from one another so that they can basically go apply for jobs um, in the case where they didn't necessarily have the best uh, reputation before. Now, the third is this concept of payday loans. Do you guys have payday loans here in, in the UK or in Europe? Okay, yeah, so in the US I've at least haven't seen this take place um, on a technology level. And the reason is because there's a lot of bureaucracy with payday loans. They want to get your social security, they want to get your bank data, they want to withhold funds for 30 days. And so because of that, it's not that easy to get cash instantly through a payday loan um, that you normally would be able to if you went to a cash advanced brick and mortar store. The final, is, or the final two are international banking and employment and taxation, right? There's a lot of workers today, especially in Europe, where because you have the EU, it makes it easy for people to move around and they have that citizenship status. But as people move across various countries, it's becoming very hard to figure out what the tax situation is, what their employment status is, and you know, how, for, how they can easily set up an international bank account. So this is another space where financial tech hasn't quite need a lot of inroads. But it's definitely necessary as people keep moving around. 
So when we look at the future of financial tech, we have a few things going on. The first is obviously continuing to improve the business, the merchant, the small business owner experience, as well as the consumer experience when it comes to transactions, whether that's an online transaction or an offline transaction. The other is we're always going to need access to capital, right? So financing is a very big deal. And the reason financing is a big deal is because we want to keep innovating, we want to keep growing these markets, right? So this concept of micro lending um, or even giving people access in other countries is important and there's certainly more that's going to take place there. The third is this digital currency, which I didn't talk too much about, but you know, right now we have different representations of currency, but there are new forms such as Bitcoin that are coming out. It's still unclear how the adoption will go, right? Right now it's very, very much in the, the techie culture that people are adopting it, but it hasn't quite spread to the mainstream because there are a number of concerns. And then, of course, devices, right? There are a lot of devices out there that pretty much do the same thing, but there's not one device that someone can use to do all the transactions everywhere. And then we talked about identity management and why that's important. And then the final is that we still need to have some more reporting and forecasting. So the services that exist today are very, very rudimentary. But the key thing I want you to emphasize is that it's not about making money, it's more about securing it, right? People want to be able to secure their funds, whether if it's to start a business or to keep their funds because they want to save um, and they want to grow their money. So just to review, we talked a lot about the online market, right? E-commerce still has a lot of potential. And it's not only that it has a lot of potential, but there's a lot going on in the space that people want to maintain not only managed identities, but they also want to transact across countries. And it's really made it a lot easier for them to offer goods and services. And not only online is it through businesses, but there's also this concept of peer-to-peer -peer transactions that's becoming more and more prevalent. Then we talked about devices, right? Once again, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges are taking place on a device level, but they're also taking place at a business level. And then we talked about financial reporting, and right now, with the financial reporting services, they're really just limited to individuals, um, but you know, most of them are in the US. They haven't spread into other markets. And part of that is because there isn't really this culture yet, I think, in other countries of an individual owning their finances, managing their wealth, and managing their investments. So until that becomes a little bit more prevalent, we've yet to see if there'll be more of financial services or financial tech. And then finally, the future is we're going to have a lot of forms of digital currency. We're going to need to do more identity management. And on top of that, you know, there might be uh, a way in which we want to issue transactions as people move across international markets. If they hold a job in various countries, if they want to have an international bank account, we need to accommodate all of that. But as I said before, a lot of that isn't just dictated by technology. A lot of it comes down to policies, right? So if there isn't an easy way to do foreign currency exchange to manage the taxation or to manage the employment records, then it's going to make it a lot harder to build a technology solution around it. So we actually have to do a lot just in terms of you know, a level of bureaucracy and policy change before we can build the technology. Now, if any of you enjoyed this talk and you know, want to chat with me more, I certainly offer office hours on my website. Um, you can book a slot for yourself. I also have online mentoring um, for people that are interested more in terms of building financial products um, or even other technology products. And then we offer a number of courses on product development on Femgineer. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Pranima. Now we have some time for your questions. Oh, back. Thanks for a great talk. My question is, you've spoken a lot about startups and small businesses, obviously. What do you see as the role for the big financial institutions and the big banks in this area? What would you like to see more of? Or do you have any good examples and evidence of when the big, the big banks have really innovated well? Yeah, well, you know, there's things that I'd like to see, and then I know that they have limitations. And so 
understanding that I actually don't hold a lot of these large financial institutions to any accountability except for please keep the money safe, right? Um, so at least what I've seen in the last five, 10 years is there's very, very slow to change. And kind of like I talked about the international markets and the countries, um, they have to endure a lot of internal policy changes. And that takes a significant amount of time. Um, and there's a level of risk associated with that. So I see less innovation happening at the larger institution level. Um, and instead what I see is copying. So by that I mean a startup will come up with a technology solution or a financial, product, financial technology product and then the bank will just basically do the same thing. And it's a lot easier because the risk is removed and they have the custo larger customer base that they can then you know, distribute it to. So I see you know, less on that. What I would like to see is that they actually innovate in terms of how they are assessing risk when somebody comes to take out a loan. Um, I'd also like to see a faster funds transfer. And I think that the larger institutions are actually the ones who, that have enough pull in the international markets where they could make the exchanges a lot easier. Right? And that's what I don't see today. When I went to Spain a couple years ago, uh, I had to wait a full week in order to set up a bank account, and that's all the time that I was there. So it didn't even make sense, right? Um, but I think if there were some easier banks, banking ways in which um, banks could, in, in, in various countries, work together and form partnerships, and make it a lot easier on the consumer, especially as the consumer is moving around. Good question. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Yeah. Hey, uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is about uh, Mint.com specifically. Sure. Uh, in my experience, the European banks are extremely protective of customer data. They don't want to release it. And since you were a small startup, how did you get the banks to provide the customer data freely? And I just, I just don't get that. How did you do it? <laughs> yeah. Well, we basically had a few mechanisms. So the first is you're absolutely right. People are very protective. I mean, not only banks, but people in general are very, very protective of their financial data. And so one of the things that we had to do was a lot of branding around this concept of security and establishing trust, especially as 20-somethings who you know, people <laughs> might not have been trusted to begin with, right? let alone that we're running a startup. That's you know, two things against us. Um, so there was a lot of branding, but you can't just you know, have a good marketing message, you have to follow through. So then we did things like um, hire our VP of engineering who came from pretty good privacy. And so he basically made the system um, pretty bulletproof and we put a lot of emphasis into not only encrypting all of the data that was going in, but everything that was going out. Now the third thing actually is that we um, did not go out and make relationships or form relationships with banks individually. We were actually built on top of a solution provider called Yodely. And over the course of the 10 years prior to us coming into the market, Yodely went out and established a number of relationships, like 3,000 to 6,000 to 6, banks um, were on their platform. And so they had a proven technology that we could plug into and get that data. Now, there were a lot of misconceptions at the time. Um, we could not move people's financial data. We could not see their account numbers or their credit card numbers. We had pretty much read-only access. But like you said, people are still very skeptical, so we had to do a lot of education around that. Thanks. Yep, good question. I can see another one, another two. Uh, have you heard of our company Wonga over here? And what do you think of them? Wongo? Wonga. No. So, uh, it's quite controversial. They do kind of like payday loans, but it's all oh. internet based. And okay. They've cool. They've got good, quite good technology, but. Um, okay, I'll have to check it out. High interest rates, anyway. Yeah. I, I, I knew that there would be somebody who would say something that I didn't know, so I'm happy that you brought that up. I will check it out. Oh, hi there. Um, you touched slightly on um, bitcoins. What do you view as the sort of future for digital currency? And second, um, on the, on the um, managed identities, what do you think is the best way in the future for um, 
authentication because you touched slightly on two-step um, authentication but what about fingerprints and various other yeah means? sure um, so I think anytime you have something new right people are there's gonna be a controversy around it I'm sure when credit cards came out people were like well what about all these people that are just gonna rack up a lot of debt right and then we, we saw what happened after that so even with Bitcoin, I think there's going to be a lot of controversy for quite some time. I think, though, that there are some more legitimate concerns around it, um, and, and the, the most meaning being volatility. However, having said that, you know, we know currencies are also volatile, right? Um, so then there becomes this question of, are there more benefits to using something like Bitcoin, where despite there being a currency fluctuation, you know, do we have added security? Um, and the debate around, is anonymity actually a good thing, right? In some cases, it might be. In other cases, it might not be. One of the ways in which, you know, if you're looking for a, a policy, um, might be to do things like have a restrict restricted transaction sizes, right? So you might not be able to exchange tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars in Bitcoins, but you might be able to do smaller uh, transactions. But then the argument becomes, is that even worthwhile? Then why would I set up a Bitcoin to buy a, a piece of gum, right? So I think there's still some um, debate around the benefits of it. I think the adoption, like I said, is still going to take a, quite a long time, partly because there's still a large number of the unbanked, right? So as long as people don't have access to capital, what's the point of having another form of currency? Um, so yet to be seen. Um, to your other question of the authentication, I think some of it has to come down to how uh, the, the way in which the transaction is happening. Right? So if we are in person, then using something like biometrics, right, fingerprinting, eye scanning, vo um, voice recognition or visual recognition makes sense. But when it's online, it makes it a lot harder. Right? So one of the um, startups that's come out in, um, on, on the East Coast in the US is actually trying to, to solve some of that um, by trying to do facial recognition. But then you might have like a twin or an imposter. So there is nothing that's 100% foolproof. Um, the, bigger, the bigger question is, you know, do you actually feel like two factors cuts down on the amount of fraud? And I think what people are saying is that when you have more than one representation um, of identity, then it's most likely that they are not a fraudster, whereas if it's just one piece of identification, it's not enough. Um, so I don't think it'll solve the problem completely, but I think it'll bring the number of incidents down if we have two factors. Um, and yes, we can certainly try out a number of other schemes, um, but it's gonna then require us to form these new forms of technology, right? So we're going to have to improve computer vision. We're going to have to improve voice recognition um, if we want to use all these different, you know, forms to verify identities. So there might be some products that can come out in that space as well. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much, yeah, Pranima, for you. your talk. Sure. And thank you all for being with us. You can also hear Purnima speak later today in the Women in Tech panel at 4 o'clock on the main stage. And uh, she is also giving two talks on Pythagoras stage and the main stage again at 8 at 9. Thank you.